Welcome to this session on competitiveness. My name is David Schlesinger. I run a China and media consultancy. I'm the former editor-in-chief of Reuters News Globally and the former chairman of Thomson Reuters China. Before we begin this afternoon's discussion, the forum has prepared a short video to introduce the subject. So let's run the video now. Uncertainty has eclipsed the world economy for a long time. The overshadowing sovereign debt crisis in Europe the risk of a weak recovery in the United States, combined with the slowdown of economic growth in China and other emerging economies, has cast a cloud of doubt over the global economy. Within such uncertain times, a high level of competitiveness is the best strategy to ensure resilience and sustained prosperity. The Global Competitiveness Report seeks to explore and define the common factors and policies that create sustainable prosperity for economies. In other words, we're looking at their productive potential. The considered factors range from the basic to the more complex, political institutions and governance, infrastructure, macroeconomic stability, as well as the quality of human resources are all taken into account. The country's labor market efficiency is examined, as well as financial and goods markets, and how well these factors are allocated within the economy. Innovation and the development of new technologies are also critical for more advanced economies, looking at the capacity to develop new products, improve business models, and enhance productivity. Switzerland remains highly competitive, topping the ranking for the fourth year running, with the Nordic and the Asian Tigers also performing strongly. Some Western European countries, like the Netherlands and Germany, also feature in the top 10. But Southern European countries, such as Spain, Portugal, Italy, and particularly Greece, continue to struggle. The United States continues to lead the way in innovation. However, a number of weaknesses are chipping away at its competitiveness. The U.S. fiscal imbalances and continuing political deadlock over resolving these challenges means that the country falls two more places to seven, its fourth year in decline. Russia and India have also weakened in recent years, while China and Brazil have emerged the stronger leaders among the BRICS, fortifying their rising importance in the global economy. For more than three decades, the forum has identified competitiveness as a key issue and indicator for future prosperity, and we've stayed in tune with the latest developments and thinking. In order to ensure rising prosperity in an uncertain future, we aim to integrate the concept of sustainability more comprehensively into our broader competitiveness research, capturing the extent to which countries are addressing social and environmental concerns. Sustainable competitiveness is a new concept and a potential solution to the ongoing global economic challenges we face, and that innovative thinking is detailed in this year's report. The Global Competitiveness Report is one of the leading tools for benchmarking competitiveness, both now and for the future. So what that video shows is a very balanced scorecard approach for looking at competitiveness and a very sophisticated approach, but one that in the end still leaves developed economies very much dominating the top end of the ranking of the top 10. I think it's Switzerland, Singapore, Finland, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, United States, United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and Japan. So what we want to talk about this afternoon is what countries and companies can do to become more competitive, what makes a winner, what you can train for, what you can develop, how you can develop your people and your institutions to actually have much more long-lasting, sustainable, competitive advantage. Joining me on the stage, Huang Mengfu, the chairman of the All-China Federation of Industry and Commerce from China, Prime Minister Hella Thorning-Schmidt of Denmark, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, uh, Marie-Gabrielle Inaiken, State Secretary of Economic Affairs of Switzerland, Mustafa Mohammed of Malaysia, and Gordon Orr of McKinsey, who studies companies and helps companies become more competitive for a living. Welcome all. Huang Wenfu, let me start with you, please, as the host nation and one that is rising up the rankings of competitiveness, but still not in the top 10. What is your vision of what Chinese companies can do and must do as part of the national development to become more competitive? Uh, 
Although Chinese, overall speaking, generally speaking, Chinese companies are not the best or most competitive. But some of the Chinese companies, I think, they are improving their competitiveness. They already have this kind of global influence. And I think this kind of, for example, the number of patents they registered and they owned, and the total number of of the patents created by Chinese company ranked third globally. So I think the, if we look at the corporate competitiveness, the innovation capacity is the key. If the company is very innovative and they can always adapt themselves to grasp to seize the opportunities in the market, and then they will be very successful. So I think the Chinese companies are now very much paying a lot of attention to invest in science and technology especially in innovation. This is a very important foundation for future innovation. Secondly, is investment in human capital. Human capital is the very key for innovation. So to attract the most best talents into companies and corporations will be another successful factor or driving force behind competitiveness. And thirdly, in order to be more competitive, you need to, be, you need to go global. So you need to be global. And you need to compete in the global market. So in order to be competitive, you need to be very competitive in the global market. That means you need you can have the access to the global capital market. You can have access to the global human capital market. And also you can better tap on the global resources to develop your own companies. I think such kind of globalized strategy will help Prime you Minister, out. Perhaps you could talk about some of the developed economies of the West Nordic economies in particular, do you think there are particular lessons that can be brought from their competitiveness and how will you sustain that in the future? Yeah, I do, um, because um, I think what, what this video is showing as well and what, um, what the World Economic Forum uh, assessments of competitiveness have generally shown is that competitiveness is a very complex issue. There might have been a time where we thought that uh, low taxes, low regulation, uh, was, was the best path to become highly competitive. But I think what we are understanding more and more is that that is perhaps not, it is not so as simple as that. Um, and that uh, being competitive is about uh, people, institutions, equal opportunities, uh, not wasting talent uh, in your society, uh, women, of course, as well, which is a waste of talent in many countries because you don't have equal opportunities. So that is what competitiveness is about. And um, an example I think is interesting. Um, Denmark is not on the top 10 this year. We are number 12. We will improve that for ne next year. Um, but what I do think is interesting is that you still see uh, the Nordic countries as some of the most competitive um, in the world. And the Nordic countries are, of course, different countries, but we still have um, a common denominator, which is that we are countries with uh, fairly high taxation, uh, a lot of regulation in terms of environment uh, and health and safety uh, in, in the workplace, uh, but all, and also a, a fairly large state. And from a normal, or from a traditional uh, point of view, you would perhaps say, how can that be competitive? The fact is, as you have shown yourself in your, in, in, during the years uh, that the forum has shown itself, that it is actually uh, possible to be uh, competitive. And I would actually argue that, that the countries that have had the, a strong state, high regulation, ha are the uh, and uh, of course, good economies are the countries that have come through the crisis um, in a better way than so many other countries. And when I say that we need a strong state and a strong welfare state, of course I mean in a healthy way, uh, in a way that is sustainable uh, from year to year, as, as, as a system that can be paid for uh, year to year. And I think there is a very strong point, particularly uh, after the crisis or at the, when we are on the edge of exiting the crisis, to argue 
that some of the countries that have had regulation in terms of envi environment, in terms of strong state that can provide for equal opportunities, investment in, in education uh, and investment in infrastructure, those are the countries that have come uh, that have, are exiting the crisis uh, best, uh, and those are the countries that have the future in them in terms of uh, competitiveness. Interesting. Thank you. Now, President Kagame, from a position of a country that is trying to rise up the competitive league tables, but is still in the 60s, how do you view the role of the state, and what can you do to actually help Rwanda, and what can similar countries do to become more competitive? Thank you. Um, Competitiveness, first of all, builds on a number of things. It builds on activities, on conditions, uh, on efficiencies thereof. But it also builds for a purpose. It's competitiveness for the purpose of growth. Whether it is nations or farms, it's about growth. How do they grow? With the nation, it is how that growth trickles down and impacts on people's lives. Does it make the difference? And that's why I agree with the point that has just been made. Competitiveness builds also on the compact between the top, the leadership, and the broad bottom, meaning the people. What is the how, how do the two interact to make sure that there is overall growth and therefore that growth also leads to the difference for each individual in that. So government has a role to make sure that it acts in partnership with the private sector to make sure that the vision that has been articulated within which they work serves both and both serve the vision. So there has to be a clear connection and responsibilities where the government should be investing in creating conditions where the private sector operates and thrives. In which case, therefore, it comes back to the same point made again by others earlier. It's about building institutions. It's about infrastructure. It's also about playing by the rules, which is regulation. How is, therefore, you have to look at appropriate ways of regulating these activities to make sure that there is a, a, a level playing field and on which innovation and entrepreneurship will thrive and affect and touch every life of the nation. So government has a responsibility to play its part in that in playing its responsibility with the people and not doing things for people, but rather making sure that they allow people to unleash their potential to the maximum. And there is always a potential in the people wherever you go. Thank you. When you look at Switzerland and Switzerland's longstanding position at the top of the, of the league tables, what is it that is particular about Switzerland and what is it that can be put into a playbook that could be distributed more widely that others could, uh, could copy? Well, I think the, probably the most important thing is the general framework conditions that we have and have had for many years. The stability, many things have been already uh, mentioned, uh, rule of law, institutions that work, etc. I think that has been the main issue. Not deviating from those and uh, strengthening those if possible. The second very important issue is the issue of human capital and, and education. You know, we have a dual system uh, of vocational training and academic, and I think we have been very well served, although even the forum says we should have more enrollment in academia. We think it's not what we need. What we need is more enrollment in technical, like engineers and uh, mathematicians and, and people like that. But you can study this in Switzerland without going to university. Uh, and the third thing is, of course, innovation. And uh, when I look back uh, to the 90s, even beginning of year 2000, we were not so good at innovation. We became better, also with the help of many good people coming from the EU, because this is the skills we needed and we didn't have in Switzerland, and which helped also during the last years to make a very robust economy. 
So I think uh, innovation and the unique uh, cooperation between industry and academia, uh, the government remains uh, a little bit in the back. We have some, we can give some help, but business has always to participate, so it's never for free, it's never subsidization. And it is our firm belief that industrial policy is not what we should do. Even last year when it was very difficult with a very strong Swiss franc, and suddenly people came and said, you know, we can't cope anymore because even very competitive export industries were feeling that they were uh, losing, uh, you know, margins and, and, and losing out markets. Even then we said it's not the right thing to do. So then the National Bank did the right thing and, the, and, and we continued just to ensure that the general framework conditions were good and that's how I think we could, uh, we could keep the good position we had. I hope we can con it continues. It's difficult in difficult times. And with a uh, world demand going, still growing, but growing less fast, it's difficult for a country so heavily dependent on foreign trade. That's why another important thing is open markets and open trade. Well, I think that, that leads me to my, my question no, I, for Ruma Mustafa Mohammed is that the, the emerging Asian economies have certainly had a roller coaster ride over, uh, over the last uh, several decades. What are the specific lessons about what you must do during the bad times? Uh, to prepare uh, to keep the, the countries competitive? 97, 98, uh, of course, those are very difficult years. And uh, some of the East Asian economies have been able to reform and transform. And in general, those countries which have been able to um, enhance the role of institutions, uh, strengthen uh, macroeconomic stability, uh, implement uh, measures which uh, 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 improve uh, talent, for example, uh, these countries have done well. I'm talking about my own country, Malaysia, for example. We learned lot of, lots of lessons uh, during the 1970 crisis. Uh, uh, governance was improved, the banking system was strengthened, and this has enabled us uh, to uh, do rather well uh, in, the, in the ranking. So these are some lessons we learned. And of course, we had a recent uh, European uh, American crisis, American subprime crisis. Uh, and that uh, is still, well, behind us, but uh, now we are settled with another uh, set of challenges. So uh, if you are comparative, uh, we will be in a better position uh, to overcome uh, these challenges. Uh, having said that, I just want to uh, uh, relate the correlation between uh, incomes and the, the level of comp competitiveness. Well, there's not a, a, a direct relationship, but there's, there's a fairly strong relationship between the level of incomes with the level of competitiveness. You look at the top five countries, uh, uh, Switzerland, Singapore, Sweden, uh, Denmark, and Norway, and all these countries, and at the bottom you have Burundi, Sierra Leone, uh, and that, there's, there's, to me, there's, there's a, a big, a strong correlation uh, between uh, the, uh, how competitive you are and the level of incomes. And that has got to do with other panelists have said in the last few, few moments. When you have high incomes, you can have good social protection, you can have good institutions, you have uh, education, uh, science and technology, innovation. So in our own situation, uh, talking about where I come from in ASEAN and Malaysia, this is uh, a, a challenge for us. Uh, having lots of resources, certainly uh, very deep pockets, certainly very important. Uh, it appears to us that to move up the ladder is so important to improve the quality of human talent, education, innovation, uh, S&T. Uh, and uh, for as long as we do not uh, improve on those fronts, it's going to be very difficult for us to uh, move up the, the, the chain, the, 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 the index. Finally, uh, a few words on the role of government. Uh, we believe governments uh, play a very important role, not only in terms of uh, setting rules and regulations, following the rules and regulations, uh, but also uh, in terms of taking the lead, and in our case, uh, as far as uh, East Asia is concerned and ASEAN uh, is concerned, uh, we believe a government which is, which is pro-business, governments which understand uh, the challenges being faced by business. This is key to ensuring that companies in our part of the world uh, are comparative. So those are some thoughts I would like to share with you at this point of time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Gordon, or you, you spend your life looking at companies and trying to help them become more competitive. Are there things that you see in common amongst companies that they do wrong and things that they, in common that they really should do better? Um, well, f first thing I'd observe from spending 20 years in, in North Asia is just how quickly the competitiveness of a country can change uh, and how effective governance really within a decade can transform uh, the operate the business environment and its attractiveness. Um, I think you, as, as we we looked at um, 
a couple of things that are, from, from a business point of view, are key enablers where we see broadly defined public-private partnership. Let me talk about uh, talent development first and then maybe um, harnessing innovation uh, to go with that. So I think in, in enabling the right talent development and mobility um, to become more competitive, um, highlight four, four things. Um, first, just to, to echo what you said, of um, ensuring that you're, capital, you're, you're maximizing gender diversity in the, in the workplace. Just to take a cu couple of comparisons, um, entry-level white collar in China is 55% women, in, in India is 29%. At mid-level executives in, in China is 21%, which isn't great, but it's an awful lot better than the 9% in India. Capitalize, making sure we have the policies and to, to capitalize on the talent pool. The second is to capitalize on international talent to fill the gaps. Making sure we have policies that make it easy for uh, companies to, to bring the required skills in, whether it's on a temporary or on a permanent basis, um, as individuals and also for their families. You know, creating the right ecosystem of allowing international schools. The contrast between, say, a, a Shanghai where there's a, a multiplicity of international schools and, and a Seoul where there's very few, you know, makes people's choice very easy in many instances when they're, they're deciding where to live. Um, the third uh, point that I would pick up on is um, support in the education system for developing an innovation mindset and critical thinking, particularly when we're emerging from an education system that emphasizes a lot of rote learning, creating not a complete substitution, but so perhaps something in parallel that allows more. And the experiment in Shenzhen of launching the f one of the first Chinese private universities um, outside of the national career is, is an example of that right now. And then finally, I, I, I think it's important not to forget when we talk about talent development and mobility, looking after second and third tier cities. It's very easy for, all of, to, for, for policies to end up sucking all of the talent into the Beijings and Shanghais to take a particular challenge that, that China has today. Um, yes, you can put incentives out there to help, multi, to, to encourage multinationals to invest in the second and third tier cities. But in some ways, the big challenge today is keeping the private Chinese companies. I spent time this weekend with a, a, le the leadership of a multi-billion dollar private Chinese company that's headquartered in a top five city. And the subject of conversation is, do we have to move our headquarters to Shanghai to keep the talent? And that's, that's bad for China. It's bad for the city. And I'm not sure it's actually great for Shanghai if, if everyone gets sucked in there as well. So maybe I'll just stop there at this point. Thank you. What I'd, what I'd like to ask the group is whether it actually continues to make sense to think about competitiveness in terms of individual countries, or are we moving to a time when we have to think much more about competitive regions and much more cooperation between neighboring countries to create an environment that is uh, more conducive to, to business? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> where, where I come from, again, ASEAN, uh, we are 600 million people, uh, GDP of 1 trillion, uh, growing middle class, uh, and average income, uh, average uh, GDP growth of 5, 6, 7 percent. Uh, we are, we've been talking more and more in terms of a group, uh, and I think this is a very important point. Uh, although it takes a while for us to graduate, because we have to promote our own countries, uh, which is very important. We, we all uh, come from uh, different countries, and uh, number one priority will be our own country. But uh, uh, where we come from, we're beginning to think in ASEAN terms, and uh, we believe ASEAN is becoming a, a, a more competitive region. And by the year 2015, when we achieve what we call the ASEAN Economic Community, uh, we're going to be even more competitive. And what's, what's interesting is that we're beginning to attract attention of two sets of uh, uh, well, countries and also uh, companies. On the one hand, uh, countries like China and, and America and Russia and you know, those uh, powers in the world, they're dealing with us because they rec recognize that uh, this is a force to be reckoned with. So uh, countries are, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, knocking on our doors 
uh, to engage with ASEAN. So th this is a manifestation of how relevant regional groupings uh, has become in the last uh, few years. Uh, secondly, of course, companies. Uh, we have a number of uh, global multinational corporations who have decided uh, to enter the ASEAN market. Uh, say 10, 15 years ago, they went to ASEAN looking at one particular country. Uh, but now they are looking more and more in terms of 600 million people growing middle class uh, and also a bigger uh, GDP. So uh, it is certainly relevant uh, where in, 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 in our part of the world, uh, regional groupings, uh, we're beginning to think more and more in terms of, of regional grouping. The challenge, of course, is to, uh, is to make sure that we get there. 2015, uh, we are uh, going to create this ASEAN economic community. There's some challenges, there's some bumps along the, the route, along the highway, but we are all uh, committed, all of us in ASEAN. Uh, I'm trade and industry minister of Malaysia, for example, we meet uh, on a very regular basis and uh, we do um, uh, monitor uh, progress in terms of achieving uh, the goal of creating an ASEAN economic community. Therefore, I would agree with you that in the part of the world I come from, this is becoming more and more important and more relevant. We're being recognized by countries and also by companies. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a very good question, this, whether how much you can benefit from your region also being competitive. And that, there's absolutely no doubt that if you're part of a competitive region, like Denmark is part of the EU, you can become more competitive. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. But one interesting reason is, of course, that there's also a peer pressure to be amongst the most competitive in the world. I mean, I don't, shouldn't bore you with the, with, the, with the relationship between Denmark and Sweden, for example, <laughs> but one always wants to be better than our neighbor. Uh, so it's a very high pressure uh, and, uh, and a good pressure as well to have that uh, competition within countries. We measure ourselves in terms of the competitiveness in Germany, in Sweden, in the UK, and this is important to us. Uh, but one thing I'd like to say, because it's so fashionable in Europe right, right now to blame everything on the euro and blame everything on, on the EU as such. And I think one le lesson that we have learned from this euro crisis and the European crisis is that countries matter. And what you do in a country in terms of structural reforms, tightening your budgets, becoming more competitive, it does matter. So one thing we have learned is that we, all, we can't blame the crisis on anyone else. We have to take responsibility ourselves. So by saying that, I'm also saying that even in a region like the EU, you see vast differences in our competitiveness because we have realized that what you do within, within each country actually matters. President Fiamme, yes. I think it makes a lot of sense uh, in many ways for integration to take place in the part of the world I come from, uh, East Africa, we have uh, East African community comprising of five countries coming together with a population of 140 million people. We have found that this is a very interesting relationship, however complex, it is more beneficial in terms of uh, real economies of scale, where there is even, depending on the level we have started from, each individual country within that region, we have found that together we can overcome certain challenges by being together rather than by each handling the, our, our, our challenges in, individually or separately. And this does not take away responsibility for each country to work on its competitiveness. But it's also the aggregate of that that makes the region competitive. So we have found that coming together, working together, makes it easier, for example, to build infrastructure that serves the whole region. We resolve many of these challenges together as we maintain and keep building the competitiveness for the region. We also work on the competitiveness of each nation as a constituent part of this larger area. So we have found, I think this is the best way to go. And also that's how companies work across this region and beyond. Even in terms of trade and other activities, we found uh, having made it easy for people to operate within this integrated space, it makes it easy for everyone and very beneficial. 
Several of you mentioned uh, innovation and creativity as being uh, important in the competitiveness challenge, but how do you actually stimulate that, or does it just have to happen spontaneously? Are there specific measures you can take to make a, a place, a region, a country more innovative and creative? Maybe you could start by, by giving one example for, from this part of the world that uh, I think a, a lot of people look to. If, you, if we go to Taiwan and we talk about the Shinchu Science Park, which is now home not just to two of the world's greatest semiconductor companies, but you know, 400 or 500 additional companies that cluster around it. I mean, this came out of a public-private partnership to create an innovation hub in Taiwan in technology, where the government set up ITRI, and ITRI went out and imported not just engineers and talent, it went out and bought intellectual property and brought it into the country and made it available to those startups. And then, yes, it provided some incentives, but I think most importantly, if you talk, it provides a completely transparent and efficient business operating environment, one-stop government access with it within the park, quality location and facilities close to the airport, um, and then it just created this domino effect of clustering uh, over time, uh, and then you know wrapped around it clearly a respect for intellectual property. As a, as a prerequisite for encouraging people to shift from being dependent on the government providing the intellectual property to companies and individuals creating their own. It's just, just one example, but clearly I think there are multiple in the region that have worked. One, one challenge we have in uh, developing countries is to um, uh, improve collaboration between universities and industry, and this is where the Swiss and the uh, European, some European models have been very useful, and uh, as a matter of fact, we, we're using uh, that as a benchmark. This is uh, something that we've not done too well, and we believe by improving this collaboration between universities and industry, and in the process also encouraging entrepreneurship. This will be very important uh, to encourage innovation. Uh, the innovation, we believe, uh, is central to this whole issue of competitiveness. In fact, uh, uh, it is probably the most critical element, and it's got to do with the mindsets. It's got to be culture of learning in the schools, and it's got to start from, from young, from preschool and schools and universities. So that, that's a challenge for all of us, and in, in our view, uh, rankings have been very useful. We follow these rankings uh, very closely. Uh, it affects uh, the debate in my country uh, as to what needs to be done, uh, what further reforms need, need to be done. But uh, I just want to share uh, with the panel uh, that in our view, this is critical. Innovation is critical and the need uh, to uh, improve uh, collaboration between universities and research institutes uh, and also uh, uh, companies, that's something that uh, we can emulate from uh, some of the uh, countries in Europe. Maybe as I was uh, specific, as Switzerland was specifically mentioned, I think the, the probably the most important thing is actually the whole schooling system and the good university and then um, specialized school system as we have for, techno for technological uh, issues. This has, been, this has attracted a lot of foreigners coming, the best actually coming to Switzerland, and then staying there also for a few years and, and continuing to work uh, in the country. The second is, of course, the good cooperation between academia and industry. And uh, this has uh, been working very well. It is also a little bit supported by the government because we uh, support projects. We have a commission supporting projects done by both. And uh, the, the business, which is the cooperating part, just pays part of the, of the, um, of the uh, contributes to the, f to the cost of the project. But it works very well. And uh, last year, we had a lot of new projects in the middle of the crisis. People said, you know, we have to do something, otherwise we will lose out. And it was very, the, the, the objective was very strong to be strong in that. The other one is also that we tend to see government as doing basic uh, research, but uh, applied research is done by the companies, so we have a clear cut there. And finally, big firms and SMEs cooperating together. Big firms usually had, have the money, but small or very small firms usually, and this is, you know, 98% of companies in Switzerland are small and medium-sized enterprises, there usually a lot of creativity uh, is in these companies. And so the cooperation of both uh, works very well and is also what we think one of the strengths of uh, Swiss innovation. 
Thank you. I'd, I'd like to go to the audience now to see what questions you have. Uh, there are mics. Please wait for the mic and keep your questions short and say who you're asking your question to. Please, in the front row first. Thank you. My name is Shukla. I'm from Mahindra Group in India. Uh, two questions. One, first of all, admiration for Switzerland and Denmark. In spite of high taxation, uh, they have proved to be so competitive, and both the ladies gave very valid uh, reasons. If you, keep, if you is, keep the question short, it would be question wonderful. Is, uh, you said that in Denmark, you are targeting to take it from 12 to top 10. So what are the one or two things you will do so that other countries can learn? And <laughs> second question is for President Kagame, a very simple question. A landlocked country may have challenges in manufacturing, Will the right competitive strategy be to focus on services like IT? Just a thought, so I thought I'll have your views. Thanks Thank very you. much. Okay, from 12 to 10. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, I think we're moving from 12 uh, to 10. Uh, we have, uh, I, I became the leader of, of my government a year ago, and I think one of the things that you get measured on uh, in Europe these days is your capacity to take decisions and, and in terms of structural reforms of your economy. And uh, what we have spent the last year uh, doing is uh, taking decisions on structural reforms. We have uh, made a tax reform, we have made an early retirement reform, we have uh, adopted uh, many reforms that will change the economy. And I think one of the things that will uh, put some European countries apart is their capacity to take decisions and, and then they will move into a, a different league. And I think with some of the decisions that we've taken this year, we are, we are moving up there for next year. And <clears throat> landlocked countries and IT? Yes, it's true. Our country is landlocked, so we have had to make uh, certain choices in terms of developing in uh, high, in investing in high value products, uh, but also focused on uh, IT uh, and services thereof. In fact, that's what explains the earlier point that was being discussed of the value of bringing together academia, uh, private sector or companies, and uh, government. We have, around this, for example, established uh, special zones where, to give you a feel of that, we, we have a partnership between one of the outstanding universities uh, in the United States coming to Rwanda, operating in that zone, developing our people to have certain capacities, and along that we have been able to attract certain companies to come and work around that uh, high institution. Uh, it is with the Carnegie Mellon University specifically targeting IT and other areas of technology. And we found companies are coming in to invest with that, and the government has had its role in facilitating that to happen. So that is all to meet the challenges of land rockiness. Thank you. It's the, in the back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Huang. Last year, if we look at top 100, top 500, uh, the profit margin is uh, slowed down. So uh, uh, we would uh, like to get your opinions on some of, uh, development trends. Mr. Huang, I think... I think private companies in China, they are suffering from a, a slower and slow, a smaller and smaller profit margin. This is a general trend for all companies in China. If we compare Chinese companies with uh, other similar companies, uh, their profit margin is actually, the drop in the profit margin is actually not that big. And last year, we have experienced, we were experiencing some uh, problems, uh, some financial institutions they have a super high profit margin. Uh, some financial institutions on the balance sheet, 50% of their margin are actually, 50% of the profit margin of private companies are actually earned by financial companies or financial institutions. So, and also some monopoly sector, monopolized sector industries, they also enjoy very high profit margin, but other private companies had really good growth last year. So I think in the future, we're going to see a few 
couple of changes, so yeah, things will be different. I just echo that. I think there's been a to... period of perhaps abnormally high levels of profitability for many Chinese institutions in the last few years, and the, the financial speculation that yes. many private companies have undertaken boosted their profits, but underneath the surface, um, the profits were lower, and that they were benefiting from a supernormal period of growth when capacity in many industries was lagging behind demand. And now it's getting into reverse. It's payback time, yes. My question is for Mr. Huang, two questions. First one, now we have more and more multinationals to relocate their manufacturing center to other countries in East and Southeast Asia. They believe that Chinese is, China is now losing its edge as a manufacturing center. And some uh, uh, scholars believe that this is a necessary process we have to go through as the economic transformation. What would be your view on this? Second question, uh, the policy paper issued by central government to encourage investment in SMEs or private companies by central government, why this policy paper is not that effective? First thing, first question, I think if we look at national competitiveness, in, the, in today's globalized world, each country needs to locate precisely its unique strength to improve its competitiveness. If you fail to identify your own unique strengths, and then you probably will not will fail in the global market. So over the past 20 years, China made, a, uh, made it happen. China identified its unique strengths as a manufacturing center. China has become a manufacturing center for the whole world, but over the past few years, we have a couple of changes. The labor costs is way up, and the, so for those low-profit margin manufacturing sectors, they are going through a shift are going to shift their centers to other countries. This is a very normal But I believe China as a big manufacturing center will still maintain its unique strength in the long run, although we have a surging rising labor cost, but over the years, China managed to accumulate a very comprehensive and sophisticated manufacturing system in a supportive environment. China still has its unique strengths. Maybe in Vietnam you have a cheaper labor cost, but maybe in Tibet, in Vietnam they don't have the other supportive systems for manufacturing activities. Of course, in future in the future in China is transforming its economy to focus on labor intensive and labor intensive. Shift on to other sectors. So I think in the next 10 to 20 years, China is going to build more pillar industries in the Chinese economy. Because every year we have six to seven million college graduates, and we have more than 50 million researchers and scholars. So I think with this kind of help, we're going to successfully transform our economy. Thank you. I'm David Campbell Bannerman, MEP, member of European. Parliament uh, for the East of England, including Cambridge. Um, I wanted to ask the panel about the impact of over-regulation. I'm a great respecter of Denmark, and it's good to see the Prime Minister here. Um, but the EU as a whole, I believe, is wholly over-regulated. The Commission responsible... So, so, let's, so, so, the, so let's go to the question. So many of you talked about <laughs> the importance of government. Can there be too much government? Shall we start with Denmark? I think it's hard to argue that you have too much, I mean, of course, it can be too much regulation. But if you look at my own country, you have a tremendous amount of regulation in terms of health and safety, in terms of uh, environmental standards and other, uh, and other legal uh, framework. And I, th I would actually argue that during the times where we have had uh, high regulations in term terms of environment, what the Danish companies have done, and I see some of them present here today, what the Danish companies have done is to invest in research and development so that they can live up to those high standards in terms of environment and energy efficiency. And the situation today is 
because they had to live up to high standards, they are highly competitive at the global market uh, today. And I think this is a very interesting story where you regulate and actually push the companies in a positive way so they become more uh, competitive at the, uh, at the global market. You could say the same for, uh, same for um, Food, food safety. We have very high regulation in terms of, of food safety, and there's no uh, chance that now we have uh, agricultural producers and agricultural experts in food safety operating here in China because this is exactly the type uh, of product and the uh, type of knowledge that they're interested in now. So I think you shouldn't be too scared of, of regulation. I think some good things can come of it because you can create, uh, you can be cutting edge in your business business and, uh, and use that, that as a business opportunity. Any other thoughts on that? Yes, really what some of us meant by regulation was nothing to hinder uh, good progress in, in, in terms of innovation or entrepreneurship or doing business. It's a, it's a regulation in terms of enhancing high standards and quality and also setting the ground to the point that when people come to do business in a place, they know what to expect. And what one expects is what the other expects. But in terms of doing business, they are as free to do that as, uh, and, and definitely they will benefit more from how they have done well in terms of what they needed to do. But regulation did not mean in any way uh, hindrance or an obstacle to freedom to operate the way you should, but it's just simply to enhance quality and standards and create predictability in the area you're operating in. Thank you. Yeah. I'm uh, Annette Nes from the China European International Business School, CIBS. I have a question on the change in uh, the competitive rules of the game because the economies are transforming and the new economies who are fast growing have a different balance between the state and the market. So there might be a different business environment in a decade from now. How do you see that and who are better placed? Are the Western or the new champions in this new business environment with a different state and market balance? Ah, that was going to be my final question for the panel, but thank you for, for <laughs> asking it now. So, uh, look, look into the crystal ball. How is, it, how is the landscape going to change in 10 years? The, uh, it is a very dynamic uh, process, of course. The balance between state and regulation and deregulation. But uh, moving forward, um, uh, we have to move uh, on this uh, uh, journey of uh, less regulation. Of course, as mentioned earlier, there is this regulation which, is, which has a positive impact. But having said that, I think, uh, let me comment on the regulation which results in non imposition of non-tariff barriers and which will, will be protectionist in nature. That will hinder trade. Those are not the kind of reg regulation we're talking about. Back to this balance between state and, and, and the market. Uh, in our view, uh, uh, this uh, journey towards uh, deregulation uh, and uh, more freedom of the market uh, is something which is unstoppable. Uh, therefore, uh, although there, there, there'll be ups and downs, role of the state, uh, rebalancing and all this, um, trying to um, uh, do some fiscal repair here and there, but in longer term, in our view, uh, it is almost in inevitable that to be comparative, we've got to uh, allow market forces to uh, dominate uh, the scene and the governments get out of business and be less and less uh, uh, involved in, in business activities. That's the way forward. This, what, what we're seeing now, in other words, is a temporary aberration. Uh, it's a dynamic, uh, it's a result of uh, some political uh, and other factors, but in longer term, uh, we have to uh, move uh, firmly in the direction uh, of less uh, state intervention. So other, are other views into the crystal ball. How will the competitive landscape look 10 years from now? I would like to say a few words. Uh, I think uh, market and regulation uh, should be different uh, in different countries. For China, for example, 
we're uh, having this uh, market economy, but we didn't have too much experience on that previously. We were highly influenced by the planned, planned economy. So now our major task is to fully use the market for uh, and uh, also the uh, government's uh, interference uh, should be uh, gradually uh, faded away. And the market economy, economy has already been existing in Western countries for many years. And due to the financial crisis, the government started to interfere with the economy. So if you, you can see these are two different trends. So we cannot just uh, generalize that whether the government should interfere or not. It depends on the real situation of a certain country. And the level of interference would be very different in different countries. But anyway, generally speaking, market, market should play a very important role, dominant role. Anybody else want to yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing is, is for sure, uh, you can't take the state out of the equation when you want to talk about competitivity. One of, some of the things we've discussed here today is that competitiveness is created by investing in people. It is uh, having an efficient society with a legal framework that works by investing in infrastructure, by investing in equal opportunity, and having, investing in innovation, which is based um, on what you do at home, but also a global outlook. And listing all these things, for me it is clear that you cannot achieve all these things if you have a completely passive state. You need a good combination. I think the market should work uh, as it is, does best, but you have to have an active state that invests in all these things because these are the things that we have to compete on in the years to come. Well, I would absolutely agree, but I, I think the... the of course, the path is towards more and more market economies everywhere in the world. But it doesn't mean that you don't need a state which gives the rules of the game, because even a market economy can go out of hand. So uh, I think this is what actually the role of the state is, is to do enough regulation, not too much, but the right one. And what, for instance, we do is when, when we have a new regulation, we look at the cost for SMEs. And in every proposal to the parliament, we have to explain why the cost is uh, what it is and why it is necessary. Because, of course, as if, you, if, you, if you give the SMEs more costs, then they become less competitive, which makes the whole uh, country less competitive. So it is always a little bit a balance. But uh, in the end, uh, I'm sure that uh, every country has to find its own balance between both. I'm from a China's Economic Weekly. I would like to ask Mr. Huang whether or not do you think the state-owned economy's reform will be good for the market economy and will become a major critical factor for the economic recovery of the world. State-owned companies' reform is the major reform of our reform. And China's economy can develop up to today uh, because uh, we have done a lot of work for the uh, state-owned economy and none of uh, the state-owned economy also developing in the same uh, process. But now the SOEs are faced with uh, some new uh, challenges because we're transi transitioning or transiting our economic economy, not only for the uh, non-SOEs but also for the state-owned economy. To a large degree, the SOE uh, should uh, utilize its comparative uh, advantages uh, in order to better transform. So I think there should be a certain percentage of the state uh, businesses, uh, among all the businesses in China, but in some of the areas, uh, Chinese uh, state-owned economies uh, should be privatized. So my, I, my thinking is uh, the uh, state-owned companies uh, should be capitalized, and the government should control the capital. Uh, we only have a couple the, of minutes so left, so I'd like to end uh, by asking have, everyone on the panel to really think about the future and how long it will take, five years, 10 years, 15 years, for some of the developing Asian and African nations to break into the top 10 or top 15 ranking of competitiveness. How long will it take before China or <laughs> some of the other, its Asian neighbors really moves up the ranking or some of the African nations? How, how long will it take? Your view. 
It's hard to say. I cannot comment the other countries, but I would like to say, of course, about China. By 2020, China will become an innovative country. That's our target. As an innovative country, my understanding is it has to be at least approaching the top 10 in terms of the ranking, if not top 10 already. So it's all decided by the transformation of China's economy. If in the future 10 years, we can successfully transform our development pattern and our economic economy, I think we can achieve that. But for a lot of other developing countries, I think it's very difficult for us to catch up with Western developed countries, especially for the large economies. Well, I don't need a crystal ball because uh, if the Chinese are saying they'll be uh, in top 10 in 10 <laughs> years, I'm sure that this uh, is true and I'm sure that will uh, happen um, because um, uh, this is how, uh, how things happen. The Chinese get, uh, get to where they want. That's how I uh, see it. But I do think a lot of things will change. One of the most interesting moments in this debate was when uh, someone asked from the floor, is it not horrendous that manufacturing jobs are leaving China, going to other countries mm -hmm. where they have lower salaries uh, and, and lower uh, regulation. And the reason why I think that is interesting is that it's exactly the same discussion that we have at home, where one is saying, isn't it terrible that jobs mm -hmm. are going to China and uh, we're losing the manufacturing jobs? I think there is something in this for all of us. And I think the globalized economy, if we manage to reform ourselves and be at the edge of, of, of where we should be, we, will all, uh, we, we could all strive in, in the new competition. Uh, also, some of the countries that have a longer way to go. Thank you. And your view about, uh, about Africa? How long will it take yes, to, to I move think up to this? Africa has a chance, uh, but we need to work very hard towards that. There's no doubt about it, because if you look at even the recently uh, put, uh, made report by World Economic Forum, yes, the case of Rwanda, and if Rwanda can do it, I'm sure many countries can do it even better. Rwanda, which was uh, at... Uh, 70 in terms of positions, moving forward seven places to 63 now out of the 140 countries that were surveyed. Now, if we, we, have, we work harder, we can keep moving closer to that point. But I imagine, and in Africa, for example, this year, uh, as you know, the three count, top countries, one was... Um, South Africa, evidently. The other was Mauritius. The third was Rwanda. So the other countries are working on competitiveness as well. And it's a question of focusing and working hard to achieve that. So I think in 10 years, it's not uh, exaggeration that some of the African countries can make a breakthrough in the top 10. Thank you. Very quickly, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Your, your views? Well, I'm, I'm sure that some of the Asian and also African countries will reach in the next 10 years very high levels. The question is who they put them back again. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, if everybody becomes more competitive, then, you know, it might not be so terrible to be only number 15. <laughs> right. uh, but, of course, this will depend on that. The uh, race to be at the top of the table is going to be uh, more and more intense, going to be more competitive. Uh, I think it's good for the world. Uh, people, uh, countries are going to be more efficient, more productive. Uh, they're going to be uh, uh, more innovative, uh, going to be more prosperous. So it's good for the world. And as far as uh, ASEAN and uh, Malaysia is concerned, we, we have a goal to be top 10. Uh, and to do that, we have to reform our education. We've got to be innovative. We've got to inculcate entrepreneurship. And we've got to create, uh, we've got to nurture talent. So this is uh, uh, very challenging. And we're all working hard in the next seven years to be there. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, Quick final word. We talked about talent just then being the key, key enabler on the PISA rankings of how countries do on education. China, in bracket Shanghai, came out number one last year. And I actually suspect perhaps if you did sh China, bracket Shanghai, <laughs> on competitiveness, as we've been talking about today, it might be in the top ten today. But with that emphasis on talent, and developing talent, I'm pretty confident that in the next 10 years, yet yeah, China and maybe some other Asian countries will reach the top 10. Fantastic. Thank you all very much. Thank you for a great audience.